everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Blockchains Consortium's webinar today on the FATF draft guidance and the potential threat facing the DeFi, NFT, and stablecoin industries. We're really excited for you to join us here today. My name is Clea Carrington. I'm the executive director for the Canadian Blockchain Consortium. I always like starting off, if you haven't uh, had one of our webinars before, explaining a little bit about what our consortium does. We are currently the largest not-for-profit industry organization supporting blockchain organizations across Canada. We do a lot of education, similar to our webinars right now. We teach free classes every single month. We get involved in really amazing projects. We do a lot of advocacy, marketing, and promotion for all the absolutely incredible people and companies and organizations that are doing amazing work um, and getting blockchain technology adopted all across the country. So if you're interested in learning more about us, please visit our website at canadablockchain.ca. Of course, as a not-for-profit, we couldn't go where we couldn't keep doing what we're doing without all the incredible uh, members that we have from our gold, silver, and bronze. So thank you to every single person on the screen. It's really exciting watching how this has grown since we uh, came into being in 2017. Uh, today's sponsor for the event is Memory Express. They are a new member to our organization. They are kicking off a brand new company called Bitcoin Marketplace. It's about to launch really soon, which will basically be a Amazon, but specifically uh, you can buy everything in Bitcoin. So really excited to see how that unfolds in Canada. And of course, we love it when people engage with us. So we do have a poll. We really appreciate when you take it. So we kind of learn about you know, how you're learning about our webinars. There is a Q&A. So we'll have about 45 minutes of discussion. 15 minutes of question and answer. So you have a Q&A spot. Please try and put your questions into the Q&A. I know it's really tempting to go into the chat, but it's hard to kind of go back and forth with that. So if you stick them in the Q&A, definitely they will get answered. And if you like anything that you hear today, please shut it out. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Anything that you say, we will, you know, um, well, positively, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we will retweet, like, and share your comments across social media. Take us on Canada Blockchain. Um, we have issued at a magazine. It is free content. We love it when you guys uh, read it. We have our next one coming out in uh, on May 1st, but we issue out a magazine on the first of every month. It's a really great way of keeping up to date on different topics in the industry. You can go back and read any previous issue. Uh, really hope you guys like it. It's also another great way to keep up to date on any webinars, events, topics, things like that that we have coming up with CBC. And so last but not least, to kick off this amazing webinar, um, we're going to have some very short and sweet bios. Everyone just likes to be introduced by their name and title. So again, as your moderator, my name is Kalea Carrington, and we have Anna Badur. She is a partner at McCarthy Trechalt. I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> mispronounce that. We have Melissa Smith. She's a partner at BLG. We have Matt Bagoyan. He is a partner. I, uh, oh, sorry, guys, I messed up on the slides. He's a partner at McLeod Law. And we have Amber Scott, <laughs> Chief Compliance Ninja at Outlier Solutions. I was modifying these slides today and didn't do it justice. Sorry, guys. All right, so I'm going to keep this up on the screen because we have a really meaty topic to get into, and uh, these, sl these slides are going to kind of help with a little bit of guidance for some of the questions that we have. So it's going to be a free-flowing, open conversation. So my first question to this amazing panel is, what is a FATF, and what is the revised guidance uh, which, which the cryptocurrency community is talking about? Anyone can answer first. Sure. Um, so the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF for short, is an intergovernmental body that provides recommendations for anti-money laundering to its member countries across the world. It's a global organization. Um, to be mildly pedantic, it's not a regulator, um, and it doesn't issue regulations. The funny bit about that is that it issues recommendations for countries about how those countries will issue regulation from an anti-money laundering perspective. And its members then conduct evaluation. So there's a mutual evaluation of its membership. Um, and if its members are not in compliance with those recommendations, then they can make their way onto a high risk, essentially naughty list of countries that are non-compliant with the recommendations. And that can cause all sorts of issues from a political and trade perspective. Um, so in the theoretical good bad continuum, it is theoretically very bad for a country to be non-compliant with the Financial Action Task Force's recommendations. 
from a Canadian perspective, our government evaluates our effectiveness in terms of anti-money laundering by one and only one thing, which is our FATF mutual evaluation. Um, so yeah, uh, on March 19th, um, so FATF, as I, as I call it, uh, published the draft of its revised guidance on the recommended, uh, recommended risk-based approach uh, to entities involved in virtual assets. So like banks and uh, um, crypto exchanges, uh, virtual asset service providers. So this draft guidance is um, what a lot of people in the crypto community have been talking about recently. Um, it's a, it was, was open for public consultation, I believe comments closed on April 20th. Um, I, I understand that the final version of, of this guidance might be available in June, um, but, uh, or, or somewhere around there, but um, yeah, so it, it definitely, like Kalea said, very meaty. Uh, there is a lot to unpack uh, here. Um, so I, I think, uh, like, as we'll get into, um, the draft guidance is concerning because it broadens definitions and it, it it catches a lot of individuals, um, you know, who might not have otherwise previously been uh, caught uh, under this guidance. And so if this, uh, it, it, my, my thinking is, is if the proposed guidance wasn't revised and if it was actually implemented in its current form in the US and Canada, I really think it would have a chilling effect on, um, on, 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 you know, new innovation and, 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 and new technology. Awesome, thank you. All right, so leading into my next question with what you guys are kind of seeing on the screen right now. So can you guys elaborate a little bit more on what is a VA and a VASP that I've heard it uh, pronounced that way? And how does the new guidance change the definition of these terms? Like, so who is caught by these new concepts? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in first on uh, um, so these aren't new definitions, um, you know, as, as Matt, Amber mentioned, this is guidance that was previously issued and has now been updated. Uh, that being said, you know, there's expansion here that I think is, is um, you know, particularly broad and there's a lot of statements in the, the March um, guidance that was released that, you know, the words are broad and should be interpreted broadly. And so I think, um, you know, stepping back, the concepts themselves uh, are are pretty general. And in terms of, for example, what's a virtual asset? It's really a digital, they refer to it as a digital representation of value that can be traded or transferred and used for payment or investment purposes. I don't think there's anything too um, controversial or, or groundbreaking about that. There's a lot of discussion in the guidance about the fact that. Um, there shouldn't be overlaps so to the extent that an asset's already captured under anti-money laundering regulation through some other way. So for example, if it's fiat or, or a security, then it's not intended to be captured here. Um, there's also a statement that <laughs> very uh, boldly says no asset should fall outside FATF standards. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a very, um, a very uh, ambitious definition. It's really supposed to capture things um, that are in, in the digital asset space, but are not already captured. Um, and there aren't many exceptions. I think we can stay on that, in that first slide. It'll be, we're gonna chat about it for a while. So I would go back to the first slide. There aren't many exceptions in what um, is captured as a virtual asset that, that they offer. Uh, really, they, they do talk about the fact that central bank digital currency itself being fiat is not a virtual asset. Uh, and then they also mention that um, essentially closed loop uh, items that are non-transferable, non-exchangeable, and non-fungible. Uh, and the example that they give there are, are loyalty points uh, would not be captured. But um, very broad definition that could capture a number of items, including, you know, some non-fungible tokens. And when I mentioned non-fungible, it was one of three uh, types of requirements required to fall outside. So some NFTs would be caught, 
uh, stable coins, they mentioned quite a bit in the guidance uh, expected to be caught other than CBDCs. Uh, and, and really, you know, anything that's a digital asset, but not already caught elsewhere. Um, so very kind of broad uh, scoping uh, reach on that definition. So maybe I'll pause there before we, we jump into VASP uh, to see if anyone else wanted to add anything there. I just um, wanted to uh, mention that th it, it's possible that like even digital um, tokens that are offered for sale in video games could be considered virtual assets. So like, uh, I don't know how many of you played uh, Second Life, uh, that game. Uh, I did for, for a while until it uh, didn't work on my computer anymore, but you could buy Linden dollars on Second Life. And so you could actually, you know, buy, uh, buy, buy digital property um, on Second Life and sell it and, and convert Linden dollars to Canadian dollars. And so like, I think, you know, the, the revised guidance and the, the expanded definition of virtual assets would cover things like uh, Linden dollars. And it, I, I think there's a reason for that in that um, it's possible, I, I guess, that organized crime could use those, uh, you know, digital tokens used in video games for, for money laundering. Um, but, uh, but it, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, uh, you know, if someone is dealing in these, these video game tokens, are they, are they a VASP? And I, I think on that note thus far, it's worth mentioning that uh, the Canadian regulator, which is FinTrack in its guidance has taken the position that your in-game goal is safe um, in terms of not being a, uh, a virtual currency or, or which is uh, the term that's used in the Canadian legislation for the time being. That said, we tend to move uh, relatively in, in lockstep with the FATF and our government is very motivated for obvious reasons to do so, which is why if we see this guidance come into force um, or, or into effect with the FATF as it's currently written, we would expect that changes to the Canadian legislation would follow. So for, for the time being, I think that we have some pretty good carve outs in the Canadian context in that the things that are captured are, at present are virtual currencies. Um, so things like Bitcoin, um, things like Ethereum, where they're, you're really looking at um, an exchange of value, you're looking at something that's fungible, you're looking at something that can um, easily be traded you know, from one virtual currency to another or from virtual currency to fiat. Um, it wouldn't consider things that are points, um, that are in-game tokens, that are these closed loop type of things. Um, and provided that your NFT is really a piece of digital art and not just some sort of um, token that is masquerading as an NFT uh, or, or using the NFT nomenclature when it's really functionally something else, then at this point it's not covered from a Canadian legislation perspective. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important point. You know, we're uh, at a point in time where we've got a Canadian regime that's really based on older guidance from the FATF, and this is really, um, you know, forward-looking in terms of what we may see in the future. Um, that's certainly uh, something to be aware of as you're structuring new products or, or thinking through, you know, how to, um, how, how, generally how to structure things. I, I think, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just going to say the older guidance, um, I, I think it contemplated like the centralized custodial crypto exchanges for the most part. And so, um, you know, the new fangled DeFi products were like a blip on the radar um, when the original guidance was published. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely seems like they're trying to, I agree, they're trying to be more forward thinking and they're trying to contemplate, like I think it, I read the term like, uh, uh, technology agnostic, like they're, they're it, you know, they're, they're trying to catch everything really now under the sun going forward because it, yeah, so. Um. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll illustrate that well when we talk about, you know, what is a vast versus what is not. Um, it is uh, almost everything is a vast if you really want to uh, take a, one thing away from, from this guidance. 
Um, so maybe before we talk about, you know, what is and what isn't in terms of defining it, um, I, I think, you know, it, it's a term that people are to some extent familiar with. It, it's existed for some time uh, and I, it, it's really the key type of entity that's subject to the, the requirements uh, under, uh, you know, AML guidance. And some of it is uh, fairly um, well understood and, and um, the market is really kind of adjusted to that meaning. And that's really what, you know, would be caught under branches one to three of that slide, you know, entities that essentially are exchanging either um, one asset for another or uh, fiat to, to, to crypto or doing transfers. Uh, I think what is more interesting is in this new four and five, um, yeah. which are extremely broad. Um, so four, uh, safekeeping and or administration of virtual assets, uh, and five, participation in and provision of financial services related to an offer or sale of a virtual asset. Uh, very, very broad, uh, wide uh, ranging concepts um, that are really used when you read through the guidance to capture um, entities in the ecosystem that may be quite surprised uh, that, that they are captured. Uh, so I think these are, um, you know, uh, uh, new branches that are, that are very, um, that, that have somewhat unexpected uh, scope. And, and I think tie into to some uh, degree a desire to capture what's happening in the DeFi space. Yeah, I think I'd say that the definition of the VASP and sort of the expansion there is what uh, really I think everyone is is looking at for me it was the standout issue for sure and its broadness um and you know the two things that really stuck with me on that was uh, they have a line in there that automation does not uh, make you not a, a vasp which um you know for me has some interesting practical considerations um on, on exactly who is responsible then for the aml and um the regulatory requirements and, and the other one was sort of the decentralization issue and how that works with with how they've defined vasp here yeah, and I think maybe Kalia, it's a good time to move to the next slide just so folks can see, you know, what is given as an example of what is captured by the VASP definition. Um, and I don't think we'll go through all of them in painful detail, but really, you know, you're you're capturing entities that aren't directly exchanges at all anymore, but that may be various um, participants in. Uh, virtual asset transactions that uh, may be quite removed in some cases. And so um, it, it is somewhat unexpected. You know, I don't think uh, entities providing escrow wouldn't necessarily realize that they're uh, captured under these types of uh, requirements. Uh, and as well, it captures a lot of um, more kind of developer-like activities, you know, and I think there's been, there's always been um, a thought that to the extent that you're providing the technology and not really uh, participating in the underlying financial transaction, then, then perhaps you're safe. Uh, and I think this is really an attempt uh, by the FATF to really eat away at that. Uh, again, probably to some extent, um, to be used uh, to try to capture what's happening in the DeFi space. They talk, um, quite, sorry, but before we, we jump, jump into DeFi, maybe like they, they do talk specifically about examples with uh, an ICO transaction and stable coins. Uh, and they really, you know, drill down into who would be captured there. Uh, um, but, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, a lot of that is, is fact specific. Uh, but it does give a good example of just how broad the thinking would be. Um, so maybe, sorry, um, Matt, I'll, I'll turn it to you, I think, on the DeFi to kind of build that out a bit. Oh, yeah, no, thanks. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, the, what's interesting to me with um, the DeFi is, like uh, Melissa had said, even if there, uh, you know, there is a protocol uh, that's automated and there's an automated set of instructions, that, that doesn't matter. There's still 
like FATF is saying, there's still always someone behind the protocol, um, you know, even if it's peer to peer or so called decentralized, it's a so called decentralized protocol governed by smart contracts. But, um, you know, FATF is almost saying there's no such thing as DeFi, like there's always someone behind it, um, you know, either profiting from the code or contributing. Uh, and, and I think um, FATF may have been you know, caught off guard somewhat um, by the DeFi, uh, you know, the, the DeFi explosion in the last summer. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, how do you um, enforce uh, and, 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 you know, regulate and enforce uh, AML when there's no centralized party, um, you know, to, uh, uh, that can actually, um, you know, in, in uh, that can actually enforce the regulations. And so, um, FATF, you know, attempted to overcome that issue by attributing liability uh, broadly uh, to, like, what was said, like, you know, developers, the creators, anyone profiting from uh, from the written code. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's uh, a, a lot of people that, um, you know, might, might be surprised to learn that uh, they could be considered virtual asset service providers, you know, as individuals. Uh, at, these are rules that are typically, um, you know, targeted to centralized bodies um, that have staff that have, you know, people that can fulfill the role of chief compliance officer. Uh, I, I think it would become much more onerous for an individual or, you know, a few individuals to, to comply. Um, and and it, it looks like under this revised guidance, it, it is definitely possible for an individual, you know, who wrote the code to, um, um, to be considered a, a, a VASP. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 FATF's way to attribute um, liability to to someone in, in a in a so-called you know decentralized protocol where it's it's tough to find a, a governing mind because you know like the the assets aren't custodied anywhere they're they're sent to a blockchain address um, so it's kind of a you know I guess arguably creative way um, to yeah to attribute liability. I think agnostic of the specific custody issue, though, there are a number of models that, that essentially refer to themselves as being DeFi models or, or as my personal favorite as being a DEX. But when you look at it, it's an exchange that's called itself a DEX. There, there's, there's no real decentralization. You're talking about a centralized business that is run by a company uh, that is profiting the, the same way that a traditional custodial exchange would be, um, and, they, and they've just decided to try to flip the nomenclature in the hopes that that would provide them some sort of shield from regulation. Um, and, and I think part of what the FATF is pushing back against is that type of um, a, attempt to dodge regulation when they're, it, particularly where there really is a, a company or a centralized body or a centralized person that's controlling or profiting from um, these types of, of entities or contracts. It, also, there's like, it, it, I think it raises, it, it raises a huge issue because there's going to be an awful lot of information and data that's got to have, going to have to be stored if this guidance is implemented. Um, and so there's a, there's a potential for, you know, data, breaches to occur and, and hacking and, uh, um, you know, privacy issues. Um, the other thing is that um, the FATF guidelines, um, most of them pr um, provide a, a, an element of judgment that might not be available with automated protocols and systems. Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of interesting. But yeah, I mean, there's going to be like troves of data uh, that, that you know, individuals are going to have to store, uh, and it, you know, also, um, you know, how are the VASPs going to interact with each other on a DeFi protocol, and are we going to have correspondent banking relationships? And uh, you know, it, it raises all kinds of uh, of issues, and and certainly, um, you know, the the travel rule and, and the level of due diligence that one pr protocol or people are going to have to do with uh, with individuals who are interacting. Um, with the platform, I, I, I think it, uh, yeah, it, there's, there's, there's a few big issues um, here, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, oof, the definitions being expanded and, and capturing a lot of concepts and there isn't a corresponding level of thought at this point applied to practically speaking, what would it mean for entities of having these roles to be to be subject to the requirements which have been designed with very particular uh, business models in mind. And so, you know, what would it mean practically speaking for an individual developer to be subject to these requirements? Um, what would they need to build as a compliance program? Uh, I think there's a big gap there. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, we're probably at the start of what would be, you know, a, a fairly lengthy process of deliberation if, if the, the desire is to actually implement some of these, um, because I think you're really trying to bit of a bit of a you know round peg in a square hole in terms of trying to uh, just sweep a whole bunch of different entities that are very, very different in levels of sophistication and, and inactivity uh, within probably what would just be a, a money services business type regime, which is very particular to um, you know the a certain type of activity really being at the end of the day primarily exchange and transfer. I was just going to say and uh, uh, similar to what you said on the VAs, Anna. Like they, I think the paper made it very clear that um, in their view, someone should be a VASP. There should be a VASP involved in any sort of. Um, uh, platform or or, or um, uh, VA related <laughs> program, so it, it is interesting. And I think like I think the developer would be sort of the last last resort, maybe. But it, they did sort of make it clear they would go there if there wasn't someone else who was an obvious person to implement all the recommendations on on AML and diligence. Uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting was they actually acknowledged. I think they were talking in the paper about. Um, uh, that um, if you were a licensed fast dealing with other licensed fast to sort of be uh, maybe less risky than if you were dealing with someone who wasn't licensed, but acknowledged in there that currently that people don't actually have a way to, to determine if their counterparty is licensed or not, because there's no, I don't think any countries currently that maintain lists of people who are licensed or regulated in the, in the vast space. So definitely some practical implement, implementation problems that they've sort of acknowledged, but uh, you know, I don't think there's an, a quick solution to some of these problems. Uh, with that in mind, I think I have a, a question for you guys. Sorry. Um, so, how exactly does the, uh, the draft guidance affect the the NFT space? Because we're hearing a lot about NFTs right now, but everyone's coming out with them. Some companies are launching, saying like, "Oh, we just raised three and something million dollars in NFTs." So, how how does this new how does the draft guidance affect that? Well, so I, I mean, I think I think some things. Uh, well, um, they mentioned that fungible or non-fungible tokens that um, transfer value uh, might be considered virtual assets. So if, if there's a value transfer, uh, you know, so, so some of them might not be, but uh, uh, and the difficulty to, with NFTs is, I mean, they can change form and shape and character quite easily depending on uh, you know, the, the token standard and the type of wallet that they're, they're sent to. Um, so I, I but they, I think they do, uh, FATF does open the door to saying, yeah, they, they, they could be virtual assets, depending on their characteristics. I would agree on that. If you read some of the articles about um, the interpretation of this guidance, I think uh, some were um, more, um, categorical and essentially said, you know, new guidance expands uh, scope of virtual asset to NFTs. I don't think it uh, says that in black and white. Uh, it does kind of delete a bit of language that, that perhaps um, would have been more conservative on NFTs. But I, I think when you're going back to that original definition in terms of, you know, is it a digital representation of value for investment or payment purposes, uh, you're still you know, looking at that definition, but with NFTs, you have to look at the, you know, specifics of each NFT and is it captured by that? 
uh, and or is it is it a security? Because it could be a security if there's the same royalty stream and it's uh, exchangeable, et cetera. Um, so it might be captured that way. Um, all, all this to say that this guidance does open the door and and uh, provide more basis for the thinking that you know NFTs uh, would be captured to some extent, depending on how they're structured, which is a big, long, complicated way of saying uh, it depends, which is not a very satisfying response, but- uh, A lawyer, your typical lawyer uh, response. <laughs> it depends. Um, I think that's such an important response though, that you can't just slap a label no. on it and, and have, it, have it mean something, which is why we see so much so-called in, in, in yeah. it's, it's exactly as smarmy as it sounds, but that's a term that appears a number of times in the FATF publication, and it's not accidental. Right, so-called stable coins. Yeah. Seems like they're taking a swipe at, at stable coin. Yeah, Kalei, to your question, you know, if, if someone is saying they're raising like 3 million on it, I mean, that's probably distribution of security. I don't know if there's probably some other things at play there. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've, I've heard on a security side, and I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, but we have lovely lawyers on this panel, um, has been that as soon as you fractionalize the ownership of a thing in Canadian context, then it becomes a security, uh, which is something that I, I think a lot of creators in the NFT space haven't really thought through. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's one of the, def definitely is one of the characteristics. Yeah, when you're selling in it, because just think about it in terms of like real estate, for example, um, you know, Canadian real estate, uh, there, there is there is Canadian case law, uh, you know, where someone was selling an interest, fractional interests of land, um, uh, you know, via promissory notes, and those notes were held to be securities. Uh, if you look at the definition of, I know this isn't about securities, but if you look at the definition of uh, security in, in the securities law of your province, it's, there's a whole captures an enormous uh, you know, amount of, uh, of things, uh, much like the FATF guidance. So uh, it's expansive and uh, you know, it's me meant to be expansive and, and capture uh, you know, things that haven't even been thought of yet. But yeah, definitely that fractional splitting it up. I mean, if, yeah, if you look at other industries, th those things have been deemed, deemed to be security. One of the things that I found interesting that's sort of on this slide that I just want to, to bring up and, and maybe see if other people have thoughts was on the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. I think they made it clear they're not trying to in, uh, regulate individual um, users. So with a peer-to-peer -peer one, they wouldn't be a vast necessarily. Um, having said that though, they certainly put um, onus, I think on a vast who, who would enable peer-to-peer -peer kind of transactions. Um, and I don't know that they put a lot of guidance around what that onus looks like, but it's sort of mentioned this is considered high risk, uh, you would need to do something to tell us how you're addressing that high risk, um, but then not a lot of details. And I thought that was interesting because the onus seemed to be both on the country to try to monitor these using, I think, you know, some sort of blockchain analytics or on the vast that would allow or enable peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions. Uh, I, I, I thought, you know, how broad they went on on peer-to-peer -peer exchanges was interesting. It, it shows kind of a you know, an attempt to really try to capture anyone and everyone to some extent. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about, you know, the person conducting business development as being captured like that, that was a bit, um, you know, unusual. <laughs> so basically, you know, someone who's who's marketing and, and, and you know, making sales um, being caught, which is, um, first of all, a pretty, um, you know, scary thing for people in that space. And they need to be aware of. But the second, you know, kind of going back to the original point um, in terms of, you know, if you're caught, what does that mean? How do you comply? Like, it, certainly the existing team is not built for someone who's just in a business development role as an advisor or, you know, a great company. No, it, it, it's not, it, it just wouldn't seem, um, you know, logical that they would have to comply at, at, this, you know, at the same level as centralized uh, entities, uh, you know, like financial institutions, broker dealers, it just, it just seems bizarre that, that people, um, you know, marketing 
something would would be lumped into and have the same obligations and they're not easy simple obligate like ob requirements and and you know i know amber you can and Anna, i mean you guys have seen a lot of these policies like it's not it's not easy to comply with uh these requirements and even to be an msp in canada i mean there are some serious penalties and and you know record keeping um suspicious transaction report filing there uh, yeah it just uh my point is is that these are not easy obligations to follow and they no, they're they're weighty and they vary jurisdiction yeah. to jurisdiction mm -hmm. um which which is i i think the other interesting point is that what you have to do in canada is not the same as what you have to do in the us or europe or anywhere else and so whether or not you can deploy something globally you're beholden to the regulators in each jurisdiction in which you operate or potentially touch customers so it doesn't matter if you have an office there or not it doesn't matter where you're incorporated you serve a single u.s person you can become beholden to u.s law yeah yeah and these these requirements um can't be fully automated either. And so, you know, you you are kind of caught in that struggle that you may have built something that is otherwise fully automated, but to comply with AML requirements, there needs to be a human aspect to it. You know, some of it can be automated, obviously, you know, on the KYC and, and some of the some of the reporting, but then there is a human aspect in terms of, you know, what is suspicious here and and what is a risk-based approach, um, you know, uh, that actually requires uh, judgment. Uh, yeah. 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 Of, a, of a human, not, not yeah. a code. Um, yeah. I think that's a big issue with these recommendations um, is that, yeah, they presume that there's, uh, you know, a, just a human decision maker involved somewhere where maybe you know, there was a hired gun hired to write some of the code and they're gone and they don't really have anything to do um, with with the protocol anymore. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, Melissa, you had said earlier, like there's this, there's all, you know, there's that hum the person behind uh, the automation, which yeah. is true. flip to the next slide yeah. it gives a bit in terms of what is not a VASP although uh, frankly it's, it's pretty um, pretty limited and so examples of things that are not a VASP um, basically entities that may be part of a virtual as a network but not engaged in the activities we talked about before and so examples that give there are cloud service providers ISPs uh, merchants that accept virtual uh, assets for, as, as a way of payment are another example they give. On the DeFi, they did say, you know, the DAP itself is likely not a VASP. Uh, and then they go through a pretty um, specific uh, example on stable coins, uh, which looks like one uh, that would have been uh, or would be offered by a large global entity. Um, and so they give examples of entities within that kind of structure that, that wouldn't be captured uh, and in entities that would be. Um, so I'm not sure that there's that much encouraging here, but they do give examples of things that are not of us. So I have a question then. Um, how does the, uh, the draft guidance affect things like stable coins if they're not depending on may or may not be considered a VASP or maybe, sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Um, they're not, they certainly don't say uh, that a stable coin arrangement wouldn't involve a VASP. Um, there are a, a multitude of entities that may be involved in a stable coin arrangement. And so, you know, some may be simpler than others uh, and involve um, perhaps just an issuer uh, and, and some third parties, but some are, are more complex, involve foundations, et cetera. So they, um, they certainly make clear that they see stable coins as virtual assets and uh, that there would be VASPs involved. It's just that depending on how you structure, there may be entities that aren't, um, that aren't a VASP that are part of that structure, but there are certainly entities that are 
Um, so if we go back to the prior slide, there were examples of who would be caught uh, in, in the scope of uh, VAS involved in a stable coin arrangement. These are just examples here of who might not be caught. And, and some of it, frankly, is pretty self-evident, you know, individual users and manufacturers of hardware wallets, uh, we would, you know, strongly hope uh, wouldn't be caught. Uh, cloud service providers, I, I don't think there's anything um, too uh, uh, helpful there. Like, I don't think anyone really expected those types of parties to be caught. Um, but they do, you know, say, for example, the reserve fund um, most likely wouldn't be caught or a validator. But, you know, they do give a number of entities that they would consider caught. And it's it is quite broad. Um, yeah. If you go back a slide, Kalea, it had the list of who would be caught on stable coins. And yeah, it was very, uh, <laughs> very comprehensive there. Yeah, they, they like, um, um, even like just in DeFi, someone holding a governance token may be a VASP, which is, yeah. which is crazy broad. Um, Lightning network node operators may be considered VASPs. Yeah. But yeah, this so I think they could called stable in the original version of the guidance, they called stable coins, they, they considered them like virtual assets. But I, I think now that they like was what Anna was saying, the, the uh, developer, the governance body, just what's written there, those are new, uh, you know, named entities that, that might be considered uh, VASPs in the, in the so called stable coin arrangement. Um, it's not, not the coin itself, but the individuals behind it. So I think I think they, I read that that's what's new as far as the stable coin, yeah. stable coins are considered. And I do think they've made it very clear it's an area they're super very focused on, um, and the reason they give it is the potential for extremely wide adoption and having some large central players sort of behind uh, some stable coins. So definitely an area of focus for them. Um, the the paper is dedicates a lot of ink to specifically to so-called stable coins. I think they call it, they feel that stable coin is a, a marketing term, which is why they keep calling it so-called stable coins. Um, but in any event, there's a lot of ink dedicated to it. It's definitely, I think, an area that they would recommend a lot of focus on and that they consider higher risk. And to provide a little bit of, of context around why that's the case. There are other papers that have been written where they talked about things as being specifically globally significant stable coins. Um, and this was very much related to uh, Facebook's project. And contextually, I think it's really important to know that there are countries in which most people access um, the internet via their phone, via Facebook. Um, and there are literally millions of people in the world that view the internet and Facebook as being synonymous because that's where they have access. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, it, it's it's different when you're talking about like a Canadian developer who's developed a fiat anchored stable coin anchored to the Canadian dollar. That that model is is very different from you know the Facebook Libra or whatever its new iteration is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a concern. On behalf of FATF and others, that, that, that a stable coin could come in and upend uh, the, the global financial system if it becomes widely adopted in one of these um, communities, you know, like in China and in the, the Alipay, where, uh, you know, most payments and financial transactions are made in the app uh, owned by a company. Uh, you know, that. Um, yeah, it just uh, it makes it, I think, difficult for countries to enforce uh, anti money laundering and counter terrorist financing laws in that case, because there's no, you know, th there's no government that's reporting on these transactions because they're all being done via a private enterprise inside a inside an app or inside a platform like Facebook. So I think that's that's something new. Uh, definitely, you know, the, the advent of DeFi, uh, if, if it catches on to the extent that some people think it's going to uh, de definitely changes the dynamic uh, as far as, you know, who's available to report on financial crime. So my next question, do you think that the, the final guidance will look anything like the draft guidance? Is there still an opportunity to improve on the draft guidance policies? 
I think that we all certainly hope that it does not look the same as this guidance. Um, I, I, even though that the window in terms of the official window to submit comments has changed, if you're watching this today and thinking, oh my goodness, um, send comments regardless. Uh, one of the things that I've learned from participating in a variety of regulatory comments, uh, comment processes is that generally they have the official date, but if you submit just a bit after, they will often still accept that um, and make it part of the official consideration. Um, certainly there are a number of groups that are participating, commenting, um, that are advising the FATF. And so I am cautiously optimistic, um, but I'm, I'm going to say that there is a healthy dose of caution there. And that I, I think that we need to be prepared for the idea that this is something that we may have to think about and build for and figure out in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that cautious optimism. Um, I, I would also add there'll be, you know, to the extent that these are uh, mostly reflected in the final guidance, there's a, a second layer, which is really the Canadian implementation of these. Um, and there'd be opportunities to comment there as well. That being said, you know, Canada being a member of the FETF and, and subject to um, mutual evaluation by, by the FETF, I think there would be limited scope to um, you know, vary from the guidance once, once it's been adopted globally. Um, so I, I do think the global aspect, the global stage is, is where um, the primary decisions on, on scope of coverage will be made. Um, and so it is a, it's an important time in terms of, um, you know, what, what will be uh, caught under AML laws uh, going forward. And uh, hopefully there'll be uh, some scaling back at least of uh, the, the, the guidance put out in March. Awesome, and I'm gonna ask one more question before we get into the Q&A. We have some people very interested to hear from you guys. So how exactly would the travel rule play into this? The guidance for VASPs. Amber, do you want to take that one? Oh. <laughs> I would. I'll defer to uh, yeah. maybe <laughs> someone else, Amber, or, or okay. Anna, yeah, um, AML experts. So, so this is the travel rule, um, and and let me stress that I think the travel rule is incredibly painful and difficult to implement. I don't think the updated guidance makes it uh, the the travel rule that is any more painful or difficult to implement than it already is. I like that in the FATF. Uh, updated guidance, they did talk about the issue, uh, so particularly the sunrise issue, um, the idea that the travel rule involves sharing information between VAST across the world, and that um, there are going to be different permutations of this country by country in terms of regulation, in terms of when it comes in force, um, when countries are coming online, when solutions are coming online. And so it's difficult to get that kind of coordination globally. Uh, there's not one specific system to do that. Um, if you're building systems as a privacy nerd, I'm just going to throw down, please don't put private information on a public blockchain. It's a super bad idea. Don't do it. Um, and and I, no matter what you're building, I cannot stress that enough. Um, we're not ready. There's no way to do this properly. Um, there are a couple of pieces in the guidance, though, that aren't travel rule specific, that are really about information sharing between VATs that got my hackles up. And one of those pieces, so, it, so it's point 264 in this lengthy piece of guidance that talks about VASPs getting each other's compliance programs and evaluating each other's compliance and treating each other as if they were correspondent banks by establishing a standard that goes well above and beyond what correspondent banks actually do for one another um, despite the fact that if Melissa and I are both BASPs and I'm sending a transaction to her on behalf of one client, that is very different from me agreeing to be her correspondent in terms of dealing with all that is Canada. So I thought that that uh, particular piece was uh, misguided. Yeah. Yeah, I would um, share that surprise and apprehension typically entities treat their compliance program as highly proprietary 
you know, both from a competitive perspective and, and obviously nobody wants their compliance program being leaked in any way because then you're, you're vulnerable to uh, being exploited. And so typically entities are remarkably um, wary of sharing that information with one another. And, uh, you know, we, we, we see that um, when doing due diligence, for example, on entities that some, some will share them and some will not. And the idea that in order to engage in a single transaction, you would need to share that kind of information um, is, is highly impractical and, and not something that you see in other industries. Uh, and so it seems surprising. It's a bit buried in there, um, you know, as Amber mentioned, um, but it's one of those kind of little statements that, that could um, throw a lot of wrench into uh, transactions in the industry. Um, so that's ho hopefully one that will get at least scaled back substantially in, in the final guidance, if not, frankly, outright deleted. Yeah. That's a hope. Well, no, just, I mean, it goes back to what I was thinking about the, if this is implemented and in, in, including the travel rule, we'll have like gargantuan amounts of information that have to be stored somewhere. And, and you know, how is that going to be protected? And there's a big risk of, uh, you know, uh, personal data uh, being leaked. And, and anytime you're storing large amounts of data, there's a certain amount of risk involved. Uh, so I, I don't think this, you know, the, the, that helps that issue. And, and, you know, we're concerned with privacy now. And um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly concerns over how the, the information is being safeguarded. Um, w w one thing I just quickly wanted to mention before the Q&A, just, just um, the, 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 the amount of uh, illicit crypto transactions is, is so minimal compared to the overall uh, activity. This is totally just a different topic, but I, I just want to read a stat. So in 2020, uh, illicit crypto, crypto transactions accounted for 0.34% of all crypto transactions. Yet we're implementing uh, stricter regulations. Like it just, it just seems like there's not a, I, I don't know, um, you know, the, the cure might be uh, overly broad uh, and, and, you know, an overreach and, and might be in reaction to an issue that's maybe not as much of a problem as, as people think. Um, you know, and also we're trying to move towards swifter real-time payments and modernizing uh, our payments infrastructure, yet uh, we're going to impose regulations that replicate, um, you know, rules by which traditional banks are bound. It, it just seems like, uh, you know, we're, we're going backwards to an extent and, and we are uh, stifling innovation. I just wanted to say that I, I, I there wasn't really a question on, uh, you know, like why these policies are being implemented or if there is a real risk, you know, but um, anyway, so I just wanted to throw that out there. That's fair. And I, I would add to that, that I think in terms of just thinking about risk and controls, one of the things that has always struck me is that there is a real difference between something where there is an immutable public ledger where you can see all of the transactions that have happened for all of the history of, of all of Bitcoin and something where there is no electronic record. And so when we're looking at these risks, they're often talked about as being risks that are equivalent to cash, but there are real differences in terms of what can be done with this data from a law enforcement perspective where there is a crime that's taken place. Right. Awesome. So I'm going to ask our first question from the audience. So what are your thoughts on growing concerns at FATF, which is pretty much non-public private organizations that has its roots in Western ideology and has been used to influence Western geopolitical control over underdeveloped and developing nations by issuing de facto black gray listing when it was really has no legal or regulatory or statutory standing globally and the same notion of controlling banking and financial services industry incumbent powers using this platform to manage the emerging developing cryptocurrency and DLT industries. It's a lot. 
How do you think the emergence of CBDC in China and elsewhere will impact FATF future nuances? Value as developing countries bypass traditional reserve currencies, the USD and the Euro, to conduct regional trade using the CBCDCs and not going via SWIFT and IBAN type networks. A lot. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I don't understand the first part. I mean, I, I think the central bank digital currency you know, experiment in China, I, I, it, it's, it's fascinating to watch that play out in real time. Um, you know, I think there, there are, there are serious issues of state control uh, I, I over, over people's activity, individuals' activity. I have concerns, um, you know, uh, the state, uh, you know, knowing more about what people are doing than I think it, the state has a right to. Um, and, you know, it definitely doesn't help you know, the persecution of certain individuals and, and groups. And so I, I think that's the big risk with central back digital currencies. Um, I, I don't know how that's going to, how that relates to these FATF guidelines, but, uh, uh, you know, um, big data, state control, th those are all, I guess, concerns, some overreach uh, of, of yeah. uh, certain laws. Okay, awesome. Thank you. On the first part, my temptation is, is to kind of do an off the cuff, like that's above my pay grade. Um, but I will say that I think if, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business, you have to think about things in two different ways. And one of them is how do I approach this in terms of the world that I want to see and the world that I want to build, um, which is a very different type of activism from what you need to do to keep yourself out of an orange jumpsuit and stay in business. Um, so you need to meet your obligations as a business in the jurisdictions in which you're operating, and that's part of doing business. That's the nitty gritty everyday stuff. Um, are, are there venues and avenues to get involved in the other more macro conversations and macro issues? Yes, uh, but I, I see those as being very separate and distinct. Uh, keep yourself out of an orange jumpsuit in the meantime. Uh, so to the next question, it says, regarding DeFi, uh, Matt mentioned the issues with the large scale data collection that may be required and the risk management aspects of that collection and storage. Is there an opportunity for an entity to take broad leadership um, of the space and provide seamless global solution for such management? Would that entrusting your AML <clears throat> KYC as a VASP to a third party provider even be compatible with the FATF guidance? I uh, just, yeah, I mean, I think there, that, that's a great, uh, great point. I think there would be an opportunity. Um, I, I, I don't know offhand uh, if, you know, if such a third party, you know, custodial enterprise is compatible with the FATF guidelines, maybe I'll let the other panelists weigh in on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, presumably someone in the V5 protocol is going to have to store the information and, and uh, you know, it, 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 it would make sense that they would think um, about a third party custodian, uh, you know, that would potentially serve as multiple protocols. I would just add, I think the paper, and I, I can't even remember what section it was, did make the comment that you might have third parties providing these services, in which case the third parties are also VASP, um, but each VASP is still going to be viable and responsible at the end of the day, so they would have to do some diligence, get some comfort that that third party is actually fulfilling those rules. And, and not just as a one and done, but a, on an ongoing basis, yeah. because you can outsource a function, you can never outsource a responsibility. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so our next question is, uh, not a question. Um, okay, so uh, if cloud companies are not being caught by this guidance, this means the data can potentially be held outside of jurisdiction. Does this pose any specific challenges to AML? I, I don't think you. Yeah. You know, I. Well, so first of all, I don't. I don't think the guidance um, really 
impacts your ability to use cloud. Uh, I think it does give you kind of comfort that you can continue to use and, and they, the cloud provider themselves won't, won't be captured as a VASP. Um, in terms of meeting your AML obligations, they, they really you know, re remain the same. Um, the use of cloud may mean that you might have different privacy obligations, but it wouldn't really impact anything on the AML side. Um, it's really, you know, AML is really about, you know, addressing the risk of money laundering, not about the idea of where data is stored or how it is stored. At the end of the day, you need to meet certain compliance requirements and you can do that using cloud or not. Uh, that is really up to you. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, so this is from Craig. Uh, this question is for Matthew. One in 300 crypto transactions being illicit, as you mentioned, seem like an enormous number in the context of ordinary finance. Are you sure this isn't a reason to strengthen crypto's notoriously lax financial control? Well, I mean, I think there's always going to be best practices. And I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, you're, you're, um, um, I, I don't know if my, I don't know if the figure was exactly one in 300, but yeah, it, it definitely, um, you know, we, we want to model best practices and, uh, um, you know, but we want to make sure that the individuals um, who are responsible, uh, you know, are the appropriate we're targeting the right people to be responsible, I guess, for those obligations. Um, and I mean, and yeah, I mean, any level of illicit activity is is obviously unacceptable. But um, I know, I guess, you have to look at, you know, what the what the risk is, and and um, I, what you know the potential negative outcomes uh, as that I see with the FATF guidance as far as stifling innovation and. Just the incompatibility with some of the protocols that are coming out, and, and and the idea that you know a developer when they're at the at the building stage of a protocol should you know have the foresight to implement that the fat of ob, uh, the VASP obligations and consider those no matter what is is a bit is a bit of a stretch. Um, so you know because that's what FATF is essentially saying, like. You know, as soon as you start building something, you've got to comply. You're you're obligated to comply, and and so is that. Um, you know, and and will that deter people from building, uh, you know, new new products? And uh, is, you know, is, is that an acceptable trade-off for that? You know, 0.34 percent of all crypto transactions being illicit crypto transactions. You know, I, I don't know. I, I got it, it, yeah. It's a good. It's definitely a a good question. I, did, I probably didn't even answer the question. I'm sorry at this point. I, so email me offline if, and yeah, I'd be happy to provide a better answer. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so for our last question for today, for now we we're supposed to end about two minutes ago, but thank you guys for your time. Uh, can you recommend a good simple training that we can give our practitioners in the banking world so they can understand what's coming down the line? I have to say, I don't, I don't know of any um, that are existing right now. <laughs> I think it really depends on the specifics of how, what you're trying to learn. Um, and there are a lot of different avenues. There's no shortage of materials to you know, learn this space. I think the problem is possibly that there's too many. Um, I mean, in terms of keeping up with global regulatory change, um, you know, the, the horse's mouth is, is the best in, in tracking FETF and FinTrack, et cetera. You could also refer to, um, you know, blogs and et cetera. And, and I know, you know, all of us here tend to, to write quite a bit. Um, uh, and then there's also, you know, a number of providers of education or um, service providers, say uh, some of the 
entities like Cypher Trace or Chain Analysis also produce a number of materials, um, a lot of podcasts, a lot of Twitter. Um, you know, it's uh, no shortage of, of things to learn. Um, but it, it, you know, you, you want to probably target it to what you're trying to aim. So if it's um, it sounds like in a banking context, it sounds more like training, in which case I, I do recommend actually uh, consulting you know, experts that can help with training of employees, uh, as opposed to referring to third party sources that are kind of generally available. Awesome. Yeah, every, everything changes so fast in, in this space. It's, it's really hard to point to a single source of information. Uh, but but there are a lot of great content creators that are putting information out there. Awesome. Well, I have to thank you guys so much. This was such a fascinating panel. I know we have more questions and we could probably go over like at least an extra half hour on uh, the amount of questions that we have. But we're going to stop. I know other people have meetings and their lunchtime to get to. So thank you so much for joining our panel here today. Uh, if you want to learn more about um, CBC, what we do, stay up to date on more amazing webinars, please join us at candidblockchain.ca. And we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, have a great weekend.